Uh, thanks for coming to the uh, postdoc lecture series. So today, um, I'm very happy to announce uh, and introduce uh, Unai, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher in, uh, in computer science department. Um, he has been here for almost, uh, I think, for just more than two years, years, right? Just over two years. Yes. Yeah, just over two years, and he has been. Uh, well, he had been under FRQ and Team Research Award for uh, his uh, postdoc and also uh, his PhD scholarship in McGill University uh, was under the same uh, prestigious award. Uh, he has done his PhD, he has finished his PhD at the end of 2011 in uh, McGill, uh, again, the Department of Computer Science uh, and, uh, and uh, Robotics. Uh, and. Uh, he also received uh, some uh, industrial scholarships uh, during his uh, doctoral studies. Uh, he has been working actively in the area of uh, mobile robotics, uh, computer vision, human robot interaction, machine learning, and uh, software architectures for intelligent systems. Um, he is also a member of, uh, of Candle Project, uh, which is a kind of a project that the uh, the team tried to investigate robotic applications to improve mobility and interactions between uh, uh, robots and human. Um, he has, uh, of course, um, more than uh, 20, 25 uh, publications in international journals and conferences, uh, and we are very happy that we have him today uh, for his talk. So, uh, with no delay, I'll let him uh, let us know about his talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, I read like halfway through it. I was sure you were talking about somebody else. I mean, I really have not been introduced so gracefully before. I mean, not to catch my other presenters, but you know, that was, that was great. So, well, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Junayat. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the LCI, at the Laboratory for Computational Intelligence. My supervisor is Jim Little, who could not be here because he's teaching a class at four, and he's already seen this tiny talk many times over, so I didn't want to bore him again. So um, today we'll be mostly working and talking about robots, humans, how these two things actually you know, coexist and ideally collaborate and communicate and different applications of these, uh, of the human-robot interaction approach, the HRI approach as we call it. And also at the end of it, uh, especially, we, we'll talk about a bit about how much systems work actually is needed to get systems like these running. So for a computer science crowd, this might not be news, but robotics is basically an intelligent sense think act cycle. So what that means is we have a bunch of sensors on our device, on our robot, we sense the world, we sense uh, human interaction, especially in my case, um, we try to understand what's going on by the thinking process, and then we act based on that information, or not, if we know action is required. So the change can be about itself. The robot can move to different places, can interact with the human or manipulate things, or it can change um, the environment itself by manipulating objects in the environment in, in different fashion, <coughs> excuse me, in different fashions. So the, the reaches are, um, Massive, basically, these days, robotics, you can find such humanoid robots in research labs to these uh, industrial vacuum cleaners. I'm sure nobody has seen a Subaru that looks quite like that. That is a vacuum cleaner that's being used in Japan for industrial vacuum cleaning. So that robot can actually climb the elevator, go into different floors, vacuum clean the carpet every night by itself. So, and there's a seat for a driver, too, if you, if you want to drive this around and, and use this as a humongous frog vac. But that's more sophisticated than what you might find here as a Hoover. And of course, there's the human-like robots. That's the Gemini version one. And that is uh, very lifelike, as a matter of fact. And my own experience, standing three feet away from it, basically where, um, or even a little bit closer, actually, it's very hard to actually understand that this is a machine and not a human, um, not a human being. <coughs> this is a telepresence robot. So if your professor is very busy giving you time for meetings, you can create one of these things. Leave him at the office and have meetings from home or whatever conference that professors is in. That, that was actually the idea. I'm not actually making this up. That was why this robot was created. Um, and of course, the outdoor robots. Uh, everybody has seen the Google car. Industrial robots such as the KUKA robots are quite widespread in the uh, automation industry, for example, or manufacturing. 
this is my old uh, vehicle. Well, actually, I still have some part of it, uh, the Aqua Amphibious Robot coming out of a swim from Bar in Barbados. And that was my other platform, the Unicorn UAV, or more infamously these days known as the drone or a manual vehicle. And all of these, all of these methods and tools and systems are fundamentally connected by the same algorithms and the same approaches to robotics. So how does computer science come into this? Well, we look at designing what we call intelligent behavior. So basically making the machine, taking the hardware and giving it more ability so that it can actually work in, a, in an intelligent fashion. So perception algorithms, sensing, action manipulation, all those basically fall within that bigger umbrella. We also create smart hardware, um, sensors or devices, or we can look at smartphones, for example. There are robots out there that does all their comp that, that basically carry out all the computation on devices like these, these smartphones. So design of those smartphones also have some responsibility that falls on us. And obviously system architecture, integration of these two things, communicate, um, make our better communication schemes between the hardware and the software itself. And anybody who's doing software engineering, software design courses are quite familiar with terms like those. And this is pretty important when you're trying to get systems working in the real world. On the other hand, we also want robots to uh, interact with humans, interact with uh, what, as we call, our social norms and within our social norms. And a great deal of research has been going on in this domain called the cyber physical systems. It's a pretty big uh, research domain, especially if you look at the US um, research domain. Which basically means that robots are going to be beyond the systems world and now be integrated into society as computers have become over the last 30 or so years. So the first PC was the size of this desk, if not bigger, if I remember right, the IBM PC that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the 1940s ENIAC or TFX, but the PCs are, were really humongous machines. And now, the 1980s cream of the crop has one thousand less computing power than what I have on my phone. So it has actually infiltrated our lives. The goal or the vision is that robots will do basically the same. So we already see vacuum cleaners, the Roombas, the smart vehicles. There are two states in the US who have given driver's licenses to these machines to operate on the roads. Wearable computing is another option that we were looking at. Think about Google Glass, soon to, release in a, to be released in the market. The Oculus Rift, Facebook just bought it for $2 million. Technology is coming to people very, very soon. So that means this human coex, the coexistence of robots, machines, smart systems with humans is a very important aspect of research. And that means that you have to look at robots that coexist with humans as your assistant, as your companion, or as your partner. It could be social, it could be your professional partner, it could be um, your co-firefighter, it could be your colleague, it could be your co-nurse, lots of different applications that you can see this going on. So in, in my research, what I look at in terms of HRI is autonomous operations of robots, but with a human in the loop. So there is a component where humans and robots are interacting smartly, ideally, and uh, in a robust manner. And uh, we want this interaction to happen in a very seamless, seamless way. So as humans, we don't want to communicate with robots trying to program instructions on our phones. We want to be able to do so as we communicate with other humans and have these robots as assistants and companions, as I just said. Um, and not just at home, it could be anywhere. It could be at, at home, it could be out in a mining uh, application down in central BC, it could be underwater surveillance and monitoring or inspection, name it, lots of different applications. So all that comes down to are these two things, that humans and robots are together working on some common goal, and they have to engage in some degree of dialogue and by dialogue, I mean human instruction instructing the robot and the robot also understanding and engaging in some kind of communication with the human if it needs to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's explicit communication, obviously. By dialogue, we're thinking about humans sending commands to the robot, robot understanding what needs to be done, understanding the scenario, understanding the environment, and giving the human some form of feedback saying, oh, you can't do this, or no, you might. Um, that's explicit. But on the other hand, there are actions that can be defined to be more implicit interaction. For example, if the robot sees you working on something really important, it might not be the right time for the robot to come and bug you about, you know, please help me with this, please help me with this. It's, it can get annoying. Or it might be able to infer what actions to take based on his understanding of what the human's perception is or human's actions are right now. So that's what we classify as more implicit um, communication. So how is this 
put into action all these theories, all these, all these uh, concepts. So one of the motivations from my own research spanned from the domain of underwater robotics. So we had um, gotten into the, the, the applications where robots would explore the underwater uh, environment for multiple applications, mostly, primarily because of the inspection of marine life and see how over a long, long time period, and I mean tens of years or decades, uh, uh, marine ecosystems evolve, coral reefs or fish populations and so on and so forth. Of course, there are other applications. Pipeline inspection, for example, or shipping and uh, search and rescue, a, lot, a, a number of them. So we wanted to have human robot teams working together, like this. So there are robots. We have multiple. Actually, but there's one that you can see here. And the humans are interacting with each other. They are also interacting with the, um, with the robot. The problem, obviously, underwater that you cannot open your mouth to talk. You can try, but that's probably not going to end up in a very nice uh, experience. Tried that, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't come up well. So speech is not going to work. Electronic communication might, but again, the underwater medium, especially seawater, is going to attenuate your signal in a pretty massive way. And also, if you want to use something akin to a smartphone underwater, you have to make this quite ruggedized. So underwater coverings, shells, and then even to keep the functionality as good as it is here, you have to spend a lot of money to come up with hardware that you can deploy um, robustly and ruggedly, and even then very close, close distance. So underwater communications is limited with the options that we have. So what we ended up using was vision. Vision in the same way that you can see these divers communicating with each other, and we want to carry that same freeform hand gesture like concept that you know we can just do gestures and communicate our expressions, our intentions to the people. Can we do the same thing with robots? So that brings me to the first part of what we'll be talking about. This is interaction. So the problem, as I said, was we need to talk to a robot using non-speech, non non-electronic signals. What do we have? And by talk to a robot, we're talking about a robot that's our partner, so within a two meter radius, not at the end of the room. Um, and that would be possible if vision was that great underwater, but it's not. So in this close from interaction, we came up with this dialogue scheme that we call RoboChat. So RoboChat, um, for lack of a better term, is uh, what we would come up with, is a visual language for human-robot communication. By visual language, I mean it's a mixture between programming languages and also human languages. So we can do basic instructions such as go left, go right, surface, or take a snapshot, take a water sample, or you can program it using for loops and macros. So if you give repeat instructions, you can record that as a macro and then play it back at some later time. Now, what you see here is both myself here and one of my colleagues holding these tags. So these tags are what's known in computer vision and augmented reality literature as fiducials. These are specific patterns. Everybody has seen this these days, like QR codes, um, but not quite. We're using something different here. But the idea is exactly the same. It's a pattern that's easy to detect underwater or any surface using computer vision techniques. And it's pretty fast. So what, what does this language look like? And how do we deliver them? So the way we deliver them is basically like this. The diver on the underwater holds out the tags and then displays one after the other like a cue card. Same technology works on the surface. And the way it's programmed, it's not like one shot programming. You can actually give long sequence of programs to the system and then go away to your own thing. So the here's the camera gone off, the robot's gone off to explore something else, and I really don't need to care worry about what the robot's going to do. It has its instructions. Um, the code actually looks similar to this. So on the left, on the green block, you can see something like a C-like language, or a for loop, that runs four times and does some computation. Same code, same exact effect is on the right using RoboJam. It's a reverse Polish notation not language, so the operands come before the operators. Why is this, uh, what am I trying to demonstrate here, is that on the left we have 37 tokens. So 37 independent language elements, that's what I mean by tokens. On the right we have 11. So the same program can be expressed with one third of tokens. And that's important because underwater, obviously we're not going to program C while we are using our scuba gear. We only have those 11 tags to flash in front of the robot. So the point here being that to program a for loop using this RoboJet scheme, we just need limit tags, and that's it. And, and the robot's going to go out and do this for loop. And we have done many times programs like these. So to test these, like, we have a scheme, we have an idea. How good is this thing really? So we had what's known in, in uh, 
very common on the XCL literature or any other user testing. So we need the baseline. Like what is the next best thing that we can use in gestural language to compare our performance against? So we use these hand gestures on the left. Now you can see one of my colleagues, he's like programming the hand gestures, basically saying this is up, this is down, this is pitch down, straight left. So users, we had about 35 of them, were given a set of programs and a set of cheat sheets, basically saying, here's your hand gesture language, <coughs> same language, but with the hand gesture, this is what it's going to look like. And also with the RoboJet, people were given these blocks with tag patterns printed on them, and we'd have to sit in front of a computer and show them one after the other, and program the system, or try to program the system. And then the goal was to compare how good we get, how good as it is, uh, compared with RoboJet versus with the free from hand gestures. Now one little detail there is that the RoboJet scheme was completely, completely done by computers. So from the moment of detection to parsing to language output, it's all automated. The hand gestures obviously is a more difficult problem and we didn't want to get into that. So we created a wizard, basically some person sitting in a different room looking at a screen and giving us um, the assessment whether the program was properly, program, uh, properly input or not. So our interpreter for the hand gestures was a human being, because that was our wizard and he was giving us uh, the outputs. Now, one of the challenges underwater while you're handling a robot and trying to program this is you are also laden with a gas tank, an oxygen tank, um, scuba masks and snorkels and regulators, PCDs, flippers and all sorts of things. So you are trying to support your life basically underwater while you're doing this. So managing life support equipment, managing the interaction, managing other divers, all that gives you a major amount of cognitive load. So how do you simulate a cognitive load like that on the user testing side? So we came up with what our users later referred to as a DBS plan. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with this game, or might be not, because this is actually quite ancient. Uh, but it's still quite a lot of fun. Basically, we told the pro users to, hey, here's your program, do this while playing that. So, you can't just forget about ball. You have to score well with that. You have to play ball and program the robot at the same time and score well in that game. So the goal was, in our case, is that can we distract users enough to simulate the, the actions of, you know, is my PCD in the right place, is my regulator behaving, am I out of oxygen, so on and so forth, which is how they're going to play this. And on the other hand, they're showing the tanks and using hand issues to program the robot just to get them distracted. So what does that come up with? So on the left, we have these little short programs, three or four instructions only, like go forward, go left, stop. Along a number of these programs. But at the same time, they have to use a distracted task. So program and play ball at the same time, both with the RoboJet scheme and also with the hand issues. The end result was, in all these cases, on the, on the post that you see on the left, are the timing blocks. I'm just, demonstrating one aspect of it, like how fast can users program this thing. So what you might um, quite rightly point out is that, hey, your system is about half as slow as the hand gesture version, and you'd be right. So for the worst case user who has no experience with our RoboChat scheme, has this amount of, um, he takes that amount of time to program with the hand gestures and almost double that to take RoboChat. The best user, which is me, even then, the, the relative speeds are almost 50% um, of, um, of the time taken for RoboChat. But as the programs get longer, over there, and this thing works, yes, you can see that that difference is diminished. So people are actually approaching, as sentences are getting longer, the time difference between hand gestures, which is very intuitive for us, versus this flipping of the tags, it's almost pretty negligible at this point. And of course you have to keep in mind, there's two things here. One is that the RoboJet scheme is completely automated. There's no human in the loop here in the, in the, in the interpretation process. But the hand gestures are being interpreted by a person. So if you need to deploy that, you have to deploy that with a human being trying to give you performance of that degree. And the other thing is, hand gestures are almost universally intuitive for almost all of us. Depending on where you live, you might use some hand gestures more than the others. But you do use different hand gestures, and it's not unusual for people to, to pick these things up pretty fast. On the other hand, showing cue cards like uh, commands for robot programming is, is a very new concept, and we did not train people at all. We just told them what to do, and they did it. And even then, the difference is quite diminished. 
So you have a lifetime of experience with hand gestures versus five minutes of introduction to air tags and, uh, and the robot chats. The tags we use to write air tags. And this is what we get. So this is pretty promising. And um, this is promising enough that, as a matter of fact, that we are, even now, like now that I've left the lab about two and a half years down the line, this is the standard operating procedure for the Apple robots underwater. So divers carry a booklet of these tags and the robot, and they go down and they just flip the tags to operate the robot and, and do complex tasks. So that's one half of the story. Uh, there's a paper that I think, uh, I'm sorry, I listed below, which if people are interested, they can definitely look into this. It's a 2007 paper and also the 2008 paper that came on April that describes the language and the scheme in, in further detail. Um, but one thing that we haven't looked at in this is we are assuming that this is all correct. We are only assuming, not assuming, we're also considering code programs that are correct. There's no, there are no errors in this. We don't know how many programs are actually wrong and what the mistakes are going to, uh, going to be doing to us or going to the system for that matter. So there are sources of errors. Obviously, you can have some noisy input modality. So you're trying to show a tag to the system or provide speech input to, uh, to your smartphone and it hears something else. Try to go downtown to Vancouver and then try to talk to your phone or Siri or whoever you want to talk to and that creates websites like you know, DYAC. That, that is a source of joy for a lot of us because speed interpretation is so bad. Or you can actually make explicit errors. You might say exactly or completely the wrong thing and deviate from what you actually wanted to, to say. So that can actually end up having quite undefined outcome and potentially hazardous. So how we do this is we want to make sure that the program that we want to execute has, if it's deemed to be dangerous and have potentially hazardous outcomes, we want to make sure of that by asking the user first. So we confirm before we execute and we have to consider the task cost, which is our measure of danger or measure of hazard in this case. So uh, this is uh, work that I've been doing since uh, basically the end of my PhD till even now at UBC and uh, our recent work will be presented in a couple of months at, at ICRA, um, the Robotics Automation Conference. So the high level overview is basically this. So the speech or whatever mode of communication that you want to use, it's not limited to anything. It can be speech, it can be gestures, it can be anything. It comes in there. We use our hidden marker model to basically come up with potential alternate sentences or programs that might have been um, input. And that set of programs is driven through a cost assessment engine that somehow, we'll get to that in a second, comes up with cost of each of these programs. And what are the costs for executing these programs that I think the user told me to do? And for each of these programs, we also have this uncertainty measurement or a likelihood basically saying, you know, how likely is this need to say this? So we combine those two things into this utility measurement box. And the utility then looks at the overall cost saying, is this a dangerous program or not? If it is, then we dive into the program and we perform what we call a token risk grounding. So we try to analyze the sentence step by step and, and, and item by item and figure out which of these sentences or which of these words or the tokens actually contributed to this program being evaluated as dangerous. So a classic example would be in the underwater robot scenario that if I wanted to say to the robot that please dive to 10 meters and by mistake I said 100, that would be a pretty dangerous instruction for this robot because it has no capability to drive for 100 meters. It will just crack and that's that the degree of water pressure. So those items, the items that are um, deemed to be the, the contributors to cost are extracted here and then clarified token by token. And the user has a chance to say, oh no, no, I meant 10 meters, not 100. And that, once you have cleared all the high risk tokens, or high risk words in this case, you go back up, you measure the cost of the system, <coughs> you go into the feedback system, and if it's still high risk, you make sure that the user is actually aware of this, and then yes, it has already far from grounding it, and then it's high risk, then you execute. If you think that it's no longer a high risk command, you just go out and no longer need to re reconfirm the grounding, you just immediately going to execute. So this is the dialogue model that we've, we've come up with, and this is again very much work in progress, very much my active uh, area of uh, research focus, but there are pieces of that that needs a more, more, uh, more, more investigation. For example, 
how do we estimate cost? And that is uh, one of the key elements of this, uh, this scheme, that we have to know how dangerous a program is somehow. So the way we're doing it right now, and uh, again, working progress and we're investigating how we're doing this, is to have a bunch of uh, modules which we call assessors. These are generic, some of them are generic, some of them are domain specific. And each of these assessors basically take in a program and come up with an estimate of how expensive this program is with respect to one parameter of the system. So it could be energy, it could be distance, it could be depth, it could be path. What are these things? So if you say, for example, there's an example that I gave that the robot goes up to 100 meters, the depth assessor would flag this as you know, high risk or high cost. If you give a really long path or really um, twisted and convoluted path to go from a point A to a point B, energy assessor might raise a flag and say this is dangerous, this is going to take up too much energy, so this is not ideal. So the task cost model that we have basically takes into account these assessors and we come up with a combined estimate of the task cost. We do this through simulation. We do this with a simulated um, environment, a simulated robot uh, execution of the path, we come up with what we might, we might uh, see as the cost. And once we see the cost, which is basically a collection of risk, which means risk to the robot, risk to the environment, risk to the equipment, <coughs> risk to uh, the task success, all of it combined. And also the overhead costs, into, uh, taking those into consideration, such as robots' battery, robots' uh, wear and tear, and so on and so forth. We take the cost and uh, we, con we convert that into a safety margin, which is basically the <coughs> And then we compute the sentence based on this utility value that says the likelihood time safety, which is the inverse of the cost. The argument that maximizes that among all the sentences is the one we want to pick and then process. So that's how we're picking it. And that's what the user, the, the system takes into account for token risk analysis. So what token risk analysis actually does is it identifies language elements <coughs> excuse me, uh, that contribute to this high risk or high cost evaluation. So an example would be like, like here, this is in RoboJet syntax for an UAV, which says that take the gear up, then take off, height, um, hit the altitude of 100 meters, record image data, then go to altitude 200, and so on and so forth. The sequence of programming has been uh, flipped around here, which says take the gear off before you take off, which is not the ideal thing that you want to do for a plane. You want to take off, so then take the gears off. So the token risk learning system is going to prompt the user with questions like these. Did you really mean gear up in this case? And then the user has an option of saying, oh, no, no, I didn't mean gear up. I meant something else. Then you can program this. So <coughs> excuse me. we uh, process the entire sentence, find all these high risk tokens, put them in a queue, and then clar classify all of them, and then reevaluate the sentence after the clarification has been completed. So even then, if it is, um, and once the clarification process is over, then the system is free to choose whatever it wants to do based on the current uh, form of the sentence. So this leads us streamlined feedback, as opposed to having the system coming back to you saying, oh, this is a dangerous program, I cannot do it, or you know, do you really want to do it? The user has no estimate of why this program is dangerous and what is contributing to the high risk evaluation. Uh, in, in this case, you know what's actually going on under the hood. And also this gains an interaction time, so you don't have to reprogram the entire system if something is actually high cost because you made a mistake. So the cost that we did for our robot tasks during the field trials or during our evaluation on the on board, they basically look like this. So some commands with um, motion, some commands with uh, GPS locations, some commands with um, human following in the end, for example. So a uh, um, sequence of commands that we gave to the users, both underwater and also the water testing where we did off the or testing. And the goal was similar to the robot experiments, that can we come up with a measurement of you know, how much penalty are we going to pay by using a scheme like this in terms of accuracy and in terms of uh, timing, in terms of the number of attempts we need to program. So again, very similar to the last plot we, we showed in, in the RoboJet case, is that we pay a big penalty, the yellow line, by using these systems um, of feedback. But obviously, the penalty it comes at a benefit that we actually stop the robot from doing dangerous commands. We ensure safety. And similarly, we pay a big penalty in programming, time, programming attempts, because once the system stops us from doing something, we have to reprogram it. So the number of times we have to attempt to, re uh, to program definitely goes up. But the more interesting part is this. 
which says that, okay, there are actually this many errors in the user's programming data. So all the users combined tried to program the system, they made this many actual errors. And the red line says, well, these are the, the cases where we prompted the user for a feedback. Now, why are these two things on equal? There's a story that, that actually carries a very important message here. The red block basically says, I'm going to stop these programs from carrying out without a confirmation because I think these are dangerous. I think this is high cost. This will cause harm to the robot or the environment or the human or something. So I will not let this go without making sure of the user's intention. So confirmations were generated. For the missing block up there, no confirmations were generated because the system did not think of those mistakes to be dangerous. So here lies an important point. This scheme is not a program corrector. This scheme will not tell you that the program is wrong. You're doing something silly. Don't do this. It will say, oh, yeah, whatever you're telling me to do is either dangerous or not. If it's not, even if it's wrong, even if it is not what you intended to do, it will let you do it. So basically, what we're doing here is ensuring that high-risk, high-cost commands are not executed. Our safety is not compromised. We make sure that that, that doesn't happen without a user's explicit intention. And of course, with the token risk grounding, we also save on the programming time. So if we have no targeted feedback, no token risk grounding, then this is basically the, the baseline that we're at. Now, if we have some targeted feedback and the user says, oh, we, I don't need to change anything. I actually meant what I said. Then you lose some time compared to the baseline. And we have about roughly 23% worse performance compared to no token risk grounding feedback. But on the other hand, if the users actually make some mistakes and they are, having, they are given a chance to re reprogram and correct their mistakes, then they actually gain significantly, about 37%, compared to when there was no targeted feedback provided. So that actually speeds things up overall for reprogramming. Just to show you some examples of how these programs were actually evaluated in the field and also on the bench. So the robot, the Apple robot in our case, had this little screen in the back that prompted out little prompts and also the name of the command that the user um, were actually flashing to the robot with, the, with, those, with the tags on the, on the right. So the robot at this point, and all through the, the, the trials were actually not at all tethered or remote controlled um, by any means. It was completely visual guided. So the only guidance system and interaction systems that we're using are, are based on vision, so that um, RoboJet scheme that we're looking at. And the operations, which you'll see up here, is basically right on the, on the right. You can see that robot running after the, the yellow ball. So it's completely vision guided right now, trying to keep that vision, uh, the ball in its, in its target location. So it's actually doing visual surveying, which is the formal name of it. And at this point, it loses the ball, uh, and then goes into a search pattern, trying to reacquire, and not hit the walls on the side, or hit the pool patterns, and can get too close to it. And finally, it actually reacquires about at that point, and you can see it react right about there. So it flips around and goes right after, trying to find the yellow target again and, and just searches for it. So the human in the loop autonomy is basically this way. So once the robot has its task, it just goes out and does it. But at the beginning, when you're trying to reprogram and trying to give it instructions, then it has the chance to interact with you and tell you what's safe and what's not. And if it's unsafe, stop you from doing it, or at least ask your permission again. And if it's not, then it will carry on your task readily. And this, may, this scheme has actually helped us to deploy this robot in a very simple way. So the robot and the diver and those tanks, that's all you need. And you can go out in the ocean and carry out your examples or carry out your experiments, inspections, and, and the robot will, will carry out this task pretty easily. Now in very recent work, this work is actually current now under review. We have tried to take that model and expand this into a distributed model. So one of the things I mentioned is that how do you assess this cost, program cost? And how do you know this, this is dangerous? Because sensing is limited. The robot cannot see what's beyond this wall. So if I tell it to go outside the wall and bring me a cup of water, what if there is a hole right outside the door? The robot has no way of knowing this at this point. He has to somehow go over there and see it. So the, the approach that we're trying to think of, or we're trying to implement and uh, come up with, is that use the sensors not just on its own, but use the sensors that's on the user itself or surrounded in the environment. So if there are cameras in the scene, if it's an instrumented place, if a user has a smartphone, and if he allows you, the robot, to communicate with your smartphone, use all of those 
to interact with the user, come up with a better cost estimate, and thus base your risk estimate based on that. So this block here is similar to what you've seen up to here, but over here, where the component splitter basically takes up objects, actions, and locations in your command. And based on those, it has a pre-evaluation model, pre-evaluation step of what your task cost estimate initially was. And then it queries the network, network of sensors and devices that spread around and within its uh, communication uh, protocol. And it comes up, based on those three uh, criteria right now, with an assessment of, post, uh, of, of, of uh, the risk of the task cost after it has been evaluated through the network. And then we go on carrying out the same exact process with the token risk rounding as we did in the past. So um, currently, this model includes a robot, or actually a couple of robots that we have to uh, and a smart wheelchair. Uh, we have RGBD sensors, which are the Kinect-like sensors in the environment. We have cameras in the environment, just giving us RGB data. And we are also using Android phones, basically a bunch of Nexus phones that uh, users carry around. And these provide user locations, user activity, and um, or lack of activity for the matter, and a user interface device for the users to communicate with the robots or the network, so to speak. So basically, we've been using um, Google Voice, Google Speech Recognition Technology, to take our English-like commands to send to robots. And uh, Android-based uh, location scheme, we some we some some of it is given readily from the system out of the box. We enhance that a little bit. Um, to use Wi-Fi uh, access points to come up with better estimates of which room is a person currently at uh, to answer questions like those. And also um, use accelerated data and a clustering algorithm, machine learning of accelerated data to come up with potential activities of the, what the user is currently doing. So um, the vr to robot in this case is actually quite well equipped in terms of sensing. So a lot of you actually have seen it, I know a lot of you actually live right next to it, so uh, there's nothing new for you guys, but um, there's a lot of sensors here, five cameras on the head, there's cameras on the elbow, um, cameras um, and two laser scanners, there's a gripper, and of course it, has, it comes with this very nice three-dimensional simulation tool and visualization tool called Arbis, which helps us create these models and test these uh, algorithms in simulation. So, one of the things that I had an opportunity to work with, with a lot of students, um, both at LCI and also at Caris, um, and Make Engineering, what the PR2 actually kind of resides is this project of the PR2 trying to find and fetch things from, from a place. So the goal was to have the PR2 leave our lab at the LCI, go downstairs at Caris, knock on the door and deliver things to them, or take things from them and bring it upstairs. So this combined vision, this combined navigation, and also uh, manipulation, three things in, as a whole. So just to demonstrate what systems this is look like, so that's a real-time simulation of the robot as it winds through the, through the environment. And this is being displayed in Arbis, or uh, robot visualizer. And the abilities that we gave the robot was, for example, to look at the scenarios, come up with vision-based estimates of what the elevator buttons, and then somehow, using motion planning, our motion planning, uh, the, robot, uh, the elevator buttons inside and outside, and, and the elevator. So that's one of the um, applications we've looked at. Uh, there's a lot of applications that you can actually imagine being put on the PR2, but that was one of our uh, demonstrative uh, technologies that we, uh, we worked about. Um, another aspect of things, Yashar mentioned about the Canary project. This is, uh, specifically speaking, Canary project 3, the strategies and platforms for collaboratively controlled, environmentally aware wheelchair innovation. I'm stating the exact can we motion um, uh, mission statement from their uh, from their agenda? So there's a, the important bit here is that this is collaboratively controlled. So the wheelchair cannot be too smart. I'm saying this in an informal way, but it's exactly how this project is defined. So the wheelchair has to work very closely with its occupant because if the wheelchair is too smart, then the occupant might get uh, really annoyed by it. Worse yet, he might not have confidence enough to ride this wheelchair and just completely stop using it would be counterproductive for us. So we wanted to come up with measurements of um, user preference and see what the users actually want in terms of a smart wheelchair and how should we operate this. So the goal was see navigation to the environment. So if I'm hitting obstacles, we have to go around them. If we are coming close to the stairs, we somehow have to tell the user that please don't go close to that, you might fall down the stairs. 
And in the case that user does not pay heed to those instructions, take over and then safely stay him away from this danger spot. So what last fall um, the group did, actually in Vancouver, was perform a set of user of, uh, a wizard of all studies. Basically, again, similar to what we did for RoboChat, users implementing smart behaviors behind the scene for the wheelchair and putting real people, real users in the wheelchair and coming up with their assessments of uh, what they liked and what they didn't. So now we have a set of, we're going through this data, uh, user preference data, users who would actually be using wheelchairs of these, not just able-bodied people, but people with physical and or um, cognitive impairments. And we are about very close to creating a model of behaviors that we need to implement in a smart manner on this wheelchair. So one of these approaches, uh, this is uh, some joint work with our student Puriya talami and uh, Professor Ian Mitchell, is the risk assessment of collision. And how do you assess risk if a user is driving a wheelchair and about to bump into an object that is not quite being seen either by the user himself or by the sensors on board the wheelchair. Now, the scenario is basically like this. You turn, turn a corner, and this green line says, this is safe to do it like this. But if you get too close to the corner, then you might actually bump, try to bend around the bend, and that might not be nice. So we want to give the users a, a feedback, some kind of a, like awareness that don't do this, this is going to cause you some problem. So obviously, some models would be to fit sensors all around the wheelchair, laser scanners, cameras, name it, bumpers, lots of things. The problem there is that there is this, this um, sense of stigmatization. The people who actually use these wheelchairs, they feel like we're being singled out in the environment because we cannot operate these wheelchairs properly, so they tend to not like those models. Now, obviously, it's more expensive. Um, a laser scanner, a, a decent laser scanner from Hokuyo, for example, would cost you $2,000 uh, or more. So, we want to make this technology <coughs> excuse me, commercially available. So somebody who's using a wheelchair can take the developments from Canon project and put this in as an add-on and use it in their, in their products if the user wants to, to have it. So obviously cost is a real, real concern. So how do you do this? What we ended up doing is fitting our wheelchair with a white rectangle. Because that's what you might think from wheelchair, because it's actually not a white rectangle. There is a kinect-like sensor right under the chair. Um, it's very difficult to see even in my screen, and almost impossible to see over there. Uh, but if I go back one slide, uh, then, or two slides for that matter, you might notice this guy right there. It's an ASUS Action, which is an RGB depth camera. It gives us depth and RGB data from where it is. So that's our sensor, that's all we have, nothing else. The rest of the wheelchair is coming from the manufacturer as you see it. And that's our addition. So that's all we have, we have very limited sensing. And that cost us 150 bucks to pull on, as opposed to $2,000 laser scanners. So with that sensing, what Korea did um, was basically to come up with an egocentric map with the wheelchair having always been in the center of the universe. And those log uh, measurements, those are uh, the distances around the wheelchair, he keeps a track of all objects that the, scanner, uh, the RGBD scanner can actually see or have seen. So if I'm passing this, this table right in front of our, our scanner, I go beyond that, but for a short time horizon, he's going to remember that. So how's that helping us? The goal is that if I'm passing this corner, the wheelchair scanner is not seeing this anymore. But if I try to turn right, this map will remember that and will stop me or try to stop me from hitting that also. So he did some experiments, uh, some great data, and we fired off a paper for um, at a conference at IROS, the Internet Robot and Systems Conference. And the results that he got up basically, I'll give you a little excerpt from it, uh, look like this. So he traversed paths in, in the arrows that you can see. The green lines are places where the system said, hey, no chance of collision, you're fine. The orange lines were basically saying, no, 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 I'm getting a bit iffy, it might, you might hit something. The red lines are, you are going to hit something, so be careful. And we provided this risk assessment to the user. Now the exact form and the exact action of what needs to be done is, again, will be con confirmed from the Wizard of Oz study and the data analysis from that. But at least we have a system, an intelligent system, that provides high degree of risk, the red spots, every time the, the wheelchair comes close, to a collision point. Now, an interesting bit is 
if you look at the top right corner over there, and the wheelchair is pointing to what in a compass location would be southwest, it's actually trying to go back from point H to point I. So the sensor is definitely not looking at the wall or the, or the kitchen area over there. But since going from F to G and turning around at that point, he's already seen it. So the wheelchair map remembers that there is an obstacle behind me, even if I can see it. So as the user is trying to back up from H to I, it provides a very high degree of risk assessment, saying, no, that's dangerous, don't do it, even if it's not in the sensor field of view. So this is what's going on um, in terms of research. Um, I, give you, I give you a pretty brief overview. There's a lot of stuff that's under the hood, which I really can talk about. It take about four hours for that. Um, but I also wanted to talk about real-world systems about development and what actually happens in terms of getting this kind of research implemented on a real system. So this might be a little more practical for uh, system development guys, but I'll start with that one. So this robot was something that I had a lot of help, uh, a lot of hand in designing. It's a six degrees of freedom underwater uh, robot, hexapod, and also can walk on the ground. Quite maneuverable, as you see. It's, it's extremely maneuverable. It can be remote controlled with this tether in the back. And we can also collect data off board um, for later analysis. In terms of sensors, it has an initial measurement unit, a depth measurement system that has a very accurate sense of depth, and also something called a Zigbee network, and 802.15, that's the actual protocol. So a mesh network is able to communicate with close range other devices. Batteries are on board, so we don't need to provide power from an external source and it can go up to 130 feet. Uh, actually, it can go down more. Uh, we have uh, unintentionally tried that. Uh, actually, intentionally tried that, I should say. We just, that's what we tell our engineer. You know, we tried that, and nothing happened. So, great design. Uh, but yes, it's, it's gone to 150 feet, and it didn't crack. So that's great. So what can this thing do? There's four videos here, so I'm watching through all of them. It's supposed, I don't know why this is not starting all the time. So this is a typical getting out of the surf zone video. Wave comes in, Apex um, crashing, and then just you know, crawls away the bit um, On the right, you can see how fast this thing can actually move. Uh, the speed rating is over a meter per second at the maximum at a certain power setting. So you might, you better not be in front of the robot when it's coming at you. Otherwise, you're going to get a scar like this in your arm. Um, not, not wasn't pleasant. And it has enough thrust that it can actually drag a person underwater. Absolutely, for search and rescue operation, this is actually pretty good. So we put Velcros on the back and asked one of our undergraduate interns to, hey, hold on to this, we'll take you downstairs. And if you can come up, you pass the course. <laughs> Not quite, but anyway, Shane was amazing. He did this, and uh, he's been one of our most enthusiastic supporters. And uh, you can see that, you know, five foot tech guy being dragged by the robot with, uh, with that degree of thrust. So it's actually quite capable of doing so. Deployment is pretty easy. You just throw it in the water. You didn't need a crane. You don't need anything. You just take the robot over your head and throw it down. I was trying to find a video where you see the person throwing it, but basically you just throw it in the water and you just start swimming. That's all. We don't need any sophisticated uh, baby in the robot. We, do, we absolutely do not do. Um, the system under the hood looks like this. Lots of electronics comes and things going on. The computational power comes from two computers right there. It comes from a form factor that's often um, commonly referred to as a PC-104. It's about three and a half square inch board that we stack on top of one another and put the operating system, sensors, and all sorts of processing that goes on there. So in my own work, I had the responsibility to install vision computing, including cameras, sensors, um, then the computational board, what kind of computation we actually needed. The LCD display was also my side, as well as the CPU um, interface. And the OS, that's another bit of work. We had to design an operating system completely from the ground up, which we called VISIX. I'll talk about that in a second. But for real world operating system performance, we needed um, what uh, BlackBerry has acquired now, but used to be QNIX systems. QNIX is what runs BlackBerry playbooks these days. But on, in the original days, QNIX, I think they still do, they provide operating systems for automotive systems. So it's very hard, very, very good hard real-time systems, and we needed that for uh, real-time operations and water, and that's what we use. So system development, what kind of software did we do? We built this entire system on free and open source software. It's based on Linux, and uh, the QNIX system is actually now being replaced with real-time Linux kernel, so there's no uh, proprietary software in it. The vision is done with OpenCV and VXL. Uh, the robot control is done using ROS. 
and not just Aqua, it's actually the same model that we use on the PR2s and on the other robot that we've been using. The software is infrastructure that combines the vision sensing with the human robot interaction with the robot control. It's something that I named Vision Sandbox because everything that I did was in this little sandbox and some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, it stands about 90,000 lines of just C++ code. There are other things in it. And um, the basic system I already mentioned, this is a very small footprint operating system that takes about 20 minutes when you install it. And it's optimized quite well for the specific hardware that ran on the Echo robots. So as you can see, I mean, that's, that is a typical day during a field trial as we were doing these things in, in the coastal Barbados. That boat is not typical. Um, we had a very generous person with a very generous yacht giving us that boat for experiments. That, that didn't happen every day, that just happened once. Um, also, one of the hazards of field trials is that that's actually not what you want to do. You don't want to program on a boat on, a, on, a, on an ocean that's going like this, because then, uh, that arrow as it says, you might see her head on the back. There's a sick colleague of mine who was trying to program on a boat and he, he really got motion sick. Um, not what you want to do when you're doing robot trials. So, uh, if you want to program, do it on the land. This is not ideal, but often you have to do those things. So this resulted in distribution of programming codes like this. I mean, this is a fun plot that I thought, um, just for fun, I wanted to run on my code base and see how many programming languages I have and what dominates. C and C++ dominates like massively. Uh, there's a little bit of Python, Lua, and other things, but I'm a C++ person, so all of this development has happened in C++ and uh, has taken its form from there. And uh, the systems have also extended into um, a contribution to this software package called the Robot Operating System, or ROS as we call it these days. It's a collection of middleware tools, algorithms, and drivers that try to prevent people from reinventing the wheel. Basically, take contributions from the robotics community, prevent, um, sorry, present them as packages so other people can use them and prevent them from investing time into creating a solution that already exists. So our contribution to that was this system that we call ROS Multimaster Enhanced. This was um, the framework, it is the framework that runs on our phones, on our robots, on our cameras and combines all of them together. So this was joint work with our student Mark Grimson, who's, uh, who was actually an undergraduate uh, honors student and uh, this was his undergraduate thesis that I had the uh, honor to, to supervise. So he created this uh, system that would share data and services on different robots and also was quite fault tolerant. So in case the network went down or one of the robots died, we still had uh, quite strong performance. All right, so all of this basically talks about human-robot interaction in a very multiple sense. So we are using multiple sensors, multiple robots, multiple environments, and looking at multiple applications to make robots and humans work together. Um, we're talking about implicit and explicit algorithms. Uh, we're talking about how <coughs> safety is of paramount importance, and we do not want to compromise on that. All of this, the proposals, the algorithms, and everything that we develop has been validated, and currently also been being validated as I speak, and a lot of work goes into the system building. So that's what has happened. Now what happens in the future? What happens with me? What do I want to do? So I want to keep doing this, keep doing this research into sensor-based robotics. Use the sensors on our robots, come up with estimates and algorithms that help us robustly communicate with humans and make this also a natural and seamless experience. And let's rely on whatever's out there, rely on real sensing, unobtrusive. We don't want people to be annoyed by this but, or or cause harm to the environment, obviously, so that's that's an important uh, consideration for us. Uh, robustness and fault tolerance is a given, and uh, the big goal, the long-term goal, is to have systems that run around for 15 to 20 minutes, but something that you can do in your home, can learn from your day-to-day -day experience, and eventually adapt to your behaviors, and have this long-term autonomous behavior that it can actually exhibit with all sorts of robustness and fault tolerance already embedded into it. So. Degrees of acknowledgement, obviously, my PG supervisor, Rick Ludek, and the MRL team. That's uh, the people on the left. Uh, Jim has been my supervisor for the last um, two years and a few months, and I've also worked closely with a number of super professors. Bob has given me tons of advice, and a lot of it um, took me from stupid to presentable, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, I've worked uh, with Ian, Professor Ian Mitchell, and Puria on the wheelchair project, and if I go keep Saying names, it's going to be a big long list. Um, so, 
big thanks goes to NCI Garris uh, for letting me in the lab and using the PR2 obviously and uh, Elizabeth Croft obviously runs Garris and I'm thankful to her and the funding agency is uh, up here and if you can't see me in all these pictures I learned how to do animation so there you go there's me there right there and there's me somewhere in the back so thank you very much for your attention and your time and I appreciate you coming in this time of the term and if you have any questions feel free to ask About uh, about this uh, about this about this robot. Uh, so how how can the robot stay uh, in uh, in in underwater? How can it stay underwater? Uh, uh, how can the robot stay uh, stay right. uh, in underwater? Good question. So what we do is you can see some you can see this little blocks here. These these are weights. Yeah. These are just weights that we screw on. These are ballasting weights. So they give the robot a little bit of positive buoyancy, just a little bit. So if you keep the robot at this point and let go, eventually it's going to surface up. Oh, yeah. right? But it's going to be very slow. Now that's one thing. I'll, I'll finish the answer, then you can ask me the, the follow-up. Yeah. Then we use those flippers as hydrodynamic planes, the hydroplanes. You know how the submarine dives and everything? It has these big wings that it just angles. So those flippers actually work as hydroplanes, depending on the angle that they're thrusting. And that's how we maintain depth or go at different depths. So the robot based on whatever water medium we're throwing it into, is slightly positively buoyant, and then we control the rest of the buoyancy with the hydrodynamic plane, so those flippers. There is no ballast tank. We don't put in water to make it heavier or lighter. There is, there is no change of the weight. We just use the flippers. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, 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 so, I mean, I mean how the robot is saying? Uh, 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 how the, uh, how the robot, how the robot detect the objects uh, uh, in the underwater? Uh, oh, we use the cameras. Oh, so, so as far as I know, uh, the color cameras uh, is very big for uh, for dark uh, for dark areas. It's it's not going to work well in dark areas. This robot is designed for shallow water operations. So water, and also there's a light on the on the on the front of it. Uh, this video doesn't actually show it, and we don't use that light too often because it's pretty bright, very bright, and lit light. Like basically the lights that you have on your smartphones. Exactly those. We have two of those. Um, on the front, two of these in the back. So if it gets really dark, we can turn the light on, and at least we can see some things. Now, we don't always see uh, the right appearance. So for example, if we want to see the right color, that white light is going to disturb the color completely, so it's not going to give us the right colors. But if it gets dark to the extreme that we can't see anything, yeah. then turn the light on. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, 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 and thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, I'm wondering well, why with the um, programming language, why um, it, it, it seems to me you might want to build it around around macros of, of closed loop behaviors uh, that says, okay, uh, uh, swim towards the yellow object uh, for, for 10 seconds and then come back to the yellow object. Sure. Um, I know, so, so encoding with macros rather than uh, or encoding in terms, encoding in terms of behaviors, uh, rather than what seemed to be a fairly low-level uh, code description. So, okay, can you comment on that? Or? Yes, uh, it's there, and we have an ability to actually record macros on the fly. So once we have those, so the, the the decision choice was that often we needed reactive control. So basically, uh, I, I'll be very honest. The the first few years we were living our lives on the, the, at the edge of our sleeves. Because the robot, the whole point of the robot is to monitor coral reef, or reefs, not to dive into them. And based on how the tracking algorithm worked, sometimes it would just follow the diver and then find something interesting and go right into that. So in those cases, we wanted to have an ability for the user to just suddenly say stop, or you know, go left or go right. So we kept those low level constructs in place. Now we, what we did was we put a low level construct uh, a number of low-level constructs and a way to program them or combine them together into a macro. So, for example, we had, um, you know, as you said, the same behavior. You know, go to this exact location, uh, sit down for about half an hour, record videos, surface, take a GPS fix, come back. 
This would be repeated if we were to do it every every single time. But we can actually do this once and then say, you know, macro one save. Done. The next time we just say execute macro one and that's it. So we have that construct in the language already. I'm curious about uh, the time it takes to program a complex uh, program using hand gestures. Is that time limited just by how fast a human can gesture, or is it just limited by um, like image processing? The, the free from hand gesture? Uh, or the yeah, free from hand gesture. No, it's free from hand gesture was done completely manually. Like there was no, it's just like a camera looking at the user and somebody else looking at the output of the camera. So there, there is no image processing actually being done. It's just, you no. Know, is it doing this right? This should be, I mean, the person doing this it has a script, what he should be doing versus what is being done. So he's looking at the hand gesture and looking at right, wrong, right, wrong, and that's how he's doing it. Um, and we did this live, actually. There was not a case where we recorded the video and then sent it to the user. No, we, we did this live. So somebody was actually sitting in the room as this was being programmed. And the goal was to mimic, or not mimic, but to keep them on fair, uh, grounding, so the air tag system, uh, the, sorry, the RoboChat system, was being interpreted real time. So we should do this as real time as we possibly can. So that's why we did this like that. Yes. Um, but both the Daya system with the robot. I'm yes. wondering, how do you do? How do you give feedback to the user? Because I don't see screen in this robot. Uh, the robot has that little tiny screen on the back. I'll go back the video. Then probably you might see this. Um, actually, there's a video here. Let me give you a. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate, but if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask while I'm popping up this video. Exactly. I have a follow up question on this. Sure. Um, so, my question is so you analyze an entire sentence or micro and then you estimate just a thousand things and then give feedback to the user. Yes. Why not give feedback at each instruction, just saying, I've understood it? Yes, that's a good question. There's a, we looked at that model, and then we decided that we don't actually know what the intentions are going to be at that given point, unless we see the rest of his instructions. So it was a trade-off. We could do that. If there's something particularly wrong in doing, a, oh, this is too dangerous, or no, I, I'm already giving up. Like, I won't do it, or I don't want to do it. But we wanted to see the whole context of it before we did the risk assessment and then come up with an answer. Now, what we're also doing in this latest work is something that we call just-in-time, obviously everybody says just-in-time, just-in-time risk evaluation. So as the robot's actually going through, this, uh, through the sentences, so you get, you know, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. So at each of these in-between sentences, we're doing a risk evaluation. Has the work changed? But for example, like one of the comments that we tested out was, I sit in front of the TV, we do have it, well, we do have a TV in the lab, and then we tell the robot, like Charlie, which is our robot, can you get me a blue cup? And Charlie knows where I am. That's all I say to Charlie. And Charlie knows where am I, or where I am in, in the lab setting by my phone's location, because that's what's reporting location to the robot. Now I get up and move to my desk. So at the point where Charlie has picked up the cup and it's supposed to come back to me, he does a check about my evaluation, whether I've actually come back to the right place or not. So he's able to adapt his position quite easily. But if I was in a place, maybe upstairs or maybe down the stairs somewhere where he can't reach me, he would give me feedback that I can't find you. Do you still want me to bring the cup to you? And I can say, don't bother. Or in, in case if I say yes, please, then Charlie would come back to where I was sitting and just drop the cup, the, the cup and the, on the couch. That's it. Um, yeah, sorry, I still have to pick up that video, which I'm almost uh, sure I can. Yeah, there we go. So, the, the, that's that's great. That's what we have for feedback. So, a little tiny screen, it's an OLED screen, 160 by 160 square pixels. And we can program this to say little things like you know, what's been given and what sort of information you need to feedback. So the screen we basically, and in those experiments we pointed out, you know, did you mean that? Just, just this much. Because the space is limited, so that's all we could do. Um, that generates a follow-up answer for me, is that this exact form of what needs to be asked, how it should be asked, is, is another whole domain of, of research. 
this is where I need to talk to my NLP colleagues, people who do natural language processing and understand what kind of feedback should be provided and what kind of information should be processed and, and so on and so forth. So what we did here is just a basic systems demonstration which said, can you detect the risk, can you do something about it, and we did. And that's, that's the limit of the track now. operation while it's being undertaken without using the visual language. Like for example, if it's swimming away from you if you can't catch up and you can't visualize it. Can't right, so can we can we abort the operation? Um, I'll have two answers for that. One is with the language itself, no. Because the robot when it's doing it, it has no way of actually understanding where it is, especially underwater. Positioning underwater is pretty much impossible. We don't have we have no estimate of, of position and, and sense unless I surface and take a GPS fix. So the yes answer, the other answer that we said, and I said no, we can do it uh, through the system. But then again, we put in exactly those uh, those uh, safeguards to make sure that never happens. Because if it's been swimming for a certain amount of time with no feedback, it surfaces, takes a GPS fix, and then goes down. Based on that GPS fix, it does its it does its action. Uh, but that's how we put these safeguards. It's not something that's part of the model, no. But it's a part of the world system. And that's how it's uh, it's been implemented. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, 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 do you do anything for um, to, to do sensory prediction? So, so if one of the um, flippers were, were just to fall off, and, and that would you know mess up its steering, you know, it, it, it should it should somehow know or feel that something's wrong here and, and flag that. And so, do you build predictive models like that into the system, or, or would that be worthwhile doing? Or it, it is worthwhile doing. Okay. Oh, we didn't bring it. And it's funny, I'm, I have this one on my face because flippers did fall off. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I tried to find that video. It's, it's sitting here somewhere. There was there this flip, 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 and then suddenly the flipper just goes back and it goes like this. So how we did this, I mean, I didn't bring it. I didn't do anything on my side. I had colleagues who worked on uh, the, the uh, <coughs> control. So one of the best things about this is um, sort of the control, the stable behavior, swimming behavior gate was done using the IMU and what we call an autopilot module. So I only sent on an image visual serving system that if I needed to go somewhere, I said, take me to image location pixel X by Y. And that's all the black box did. And the black box took that, made sure the robot didn't roll over, and then controlled uh, the robot that way. So when I had left the lab, uh, this was an active research area. What happens if the robot's dynamics actually change? So uh, flipper loss, or we have a different payload. Uh, we put a GPS box on top of the robot actually and once upon a time and also a um, payload of uh, salinity sensors, salinity water temperature and something like uh, marine sensors that we could, we wanted to see if we can actually uh, do things with it. And we also dragged a microscope um, from our colleagues in astrobiology um, in, the, in the Arctic lakes at Axel Hyperg Island to see how, uh, if we can actually use the echo robot as a deployment mechanism. All of those things change the dynamics of the robot quite significantly. So the way we do it, by hand. That if this happens, this is how we should be doing it, and so on and so forth. But the proprioception, basically, if there's a way for the robot to understand that, oh, I've lost a flipper, I should behave somewhat differently, that's an active research, research process right now. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty very, very active research area. There's two people that I know of currently working on exactly this problem. Uh, how do RGB cameras work underwater? Because I know that these, these sensors, when they were there, the RGB sensor was not in market, right? No. So what, we, had just go, we had just gone to connect, and I wanted to dip it in a fish tank. And uh, I was told that my thesis might not see the light of day if I did that. So it was a joke, basically, saying that we had all one connect, and it was pretty much uh, an important aspect, but the connect was so big. I mean, the actions, the ACES actions, which are much smaller form factor, um, we didn't have those in those days. That we could fit on the robot, uh, but the Kinect was a no-no. So we never actually ended up doing a test, a real-life test. So the only test we've done is actually the Kinect outside a fish tank, a glass fish tank. But that really just tests the vision and nothing else. Um, and dipping the whole thing inside under an underwater um, system, which has to be enclosed in glass, is the problem. Because I'm not sure if that glass is, I think that, that element, which, which is the enclosure, will act as um, death measurement for the Kinect uh, to some extent. Might might actually screw up the death measurement system somewhat. I haven't tested it, so I do not know. That's a good question, but I don't know.
But that was what I, what I said to my, uh, somebody else who asked me the same question. I said, I don't know, but this is what I, what I envision being the problems. So, so far nobody has had it on a, on a robot? I have, on a I have no uh, knowledge of that, actually. It could have, but I don't know of that. I don't know of anyone doing that. Uh, especially the power requirements actually are, are pretty intense. Uh, so that's why you did not put that in front of the vehicles. Any, uh, any, Overall, take home lessons for, for people working on, on research that involves uh, a mix of, of algorithms and hardware and, uh, and how not to get uh, permanently distracted by, by building the system part and or, or and now it, it's, it's tricky to manage, obviously, so. Um, I, I can tell my own experiences of this. So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because I often fail to them. Well, I would say I often fell into crap, but crap was very alluring that, oh, forget about the you know, order of login algorithm that I needed to pull up a robot. I want to get this system running, have a very optimized Linux version, kernel, blah, 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 all those things. And it's tempting to, to go too deep into that. And often people do actually robotics research on systems alone, not just the algorithms. Uh, the the uh, challenges that we've faced is that often systems work is not actually dealt as real science. I would say that out loud. Um, and people think that this is not real science. This is just a background that you have to do. But this will take up almost 40 to 60 percent of your time, depending on how much investment you need to put in. Imagine the PR2. Look, I've, uh, ever since I've been here, the PR2 was there. We didn't have to do anything with the PR2 other than putting the Kinect on top of it and, and making some modifications to it. The Echo robot, when I saw it, it didn't have any digital cameras. It had no digital cameras. So I had to talk to Point Grey get them the right hardware and so on and so forth. So a lot of investment, time investment that went in into creating the system. The real goal, obviously when you're doing research in systems, um, in robotics or any other domain that involves a lot of hardware interaction, is just to try, I, just, I, I try to keep things into, into perspective by remembering that these are tools. These things are just tools that will eventually get me to more interesting, more appealing uh, sites. These are not to say the tools are not scientific enough, these are scientific tools, but I want to get to the real beauty. The real beauty is to come up with algorithms that are efficient and can run on cheap, low power, effective, hard, uh, low power and uh, affordable hardware, and yet be as effective as they can be on more expensive pieces. So, I mean, well, I, I had great colleagues, uh, people who I did my, uh, I mean, uh, this wouldn't have happened if everybody didn't pitch in. Like I pitched in somebody else's and we all help each other. And that's how we used to basically talk about therapy. Like our therapy sessions as we used to call them. And when our papers got rejected or you know, we couldn't come up with an algorithm that was cool enough. We used to talk about is LLVM better than GCC and we used to have fights over that. Now that has nothing to do with robotics. It has nothing to do with you know, is Ubuntu better or is Arch. Oh no, Mac is the coolest thing to use and so on and so forth. Because by nature this is a lot of the systems uh, work that we have to do. But again, after your therapy session is over, you have to really go back and come up with innovative ideas. Ideas are what pushes things forward. Um, and as, is, as you might have seen, a lot of this work, the systems work, actually has pushed into um, eventually ideas, even in the systems domain. So the, this robot is now, you can buy them. If you have $49,000 to spare, you can buy one of these things. Um, we have a patent on this. Uh, there's a company that's selling these robots. There's five that's been uh, already been sold. Uh, we have done, uh, you know, systems trials runs with uh, two of these robots running around and uh, lots of fun, fun stuff going on, obviously. And I just wanted to show you a quick image of this. And as I said, uh, this is, uh, I don't want to bluff you guys, but this is, uh, oh, not that. Oh, not that, not that, not that. Wrong, wrong end. That's not what I wanted to show. I'm sorry, I wanted to get to the image of the robots. Um, we have one here at, um, at uh, in Canada, there's two actually. One in uh, McGill, uh, sorry, two in McGill and one in New York, and there's a couple of robots in Mexico. So that's how it stands now, but there are more people who are really interested in getting this robot, doing some interesting research on them. So what what is going on here? I'm exactly, oh, okay, I see what's going on. So that is, um, on the left is ours, the one from McGill, and the one, we used to call this Ramius. If anybody is a Tom Clancy fan, you might um, know what the name comes from, I guess not. Hunt for the Red October? No, okay. So that's Ramius, and the one on the right, we named this Croy, which is York, spelled backward. Um, 
ran out of ideas. Um, and even we ran out of more ideas, with the one ship to Mexico we called the Mexibot. So they were quite thrilled by them actually, so they liked them. Anyway, so yes, systems, algorithms, all that, long-winded answer, I'm really sorry, but it's basically saying there is no short answer that helps you, you know, don't get distracted, don't get demoralized if your system blows up on you, um, has happened to all of us, and we try to take it in the stride as you know, a matter of fun. We had t-shirts that said, you know, if, you're, if it's not smoking, you're not doing it right. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting that's quite accurate, but we smoked a few things, and even then, you know, things like this happened. And the reward, the validation reward is, is massive. Once you see these things working, and you get like all those hours in the lab, you know, sitting in the sun, you know, I was white once upon a time, obviously, the sun burned this to me. Um, it just makes you really, really happy. So just take that uh, in your stride, go forward, and you know, just don't, uh, don't get bogged down. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.
as a real instructor, yeah. yeah. you know, you've made a mistake, right? So you have to be like, I don't know if you guys do it. Yeah. 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 Everything is going to be saturated, or are able somehow to sand it down with aperture and imaging. Then it's not going to be any. Okay, I will be not. I'll not. It's not kind of any signal at all. That's an interesting point, actually. I'm trying to remember that. It's a very interesting point. It's there, but it's... Truly, we have it for It's there, but we can't protect it from background. Sure. You probably don't need them if they're from Microsoft, but you never know.